How we doing, everybody? Andy Malfrina here. Welcome to a brand new episode of No More Heroes. Today on the show, we have Jose from the No Way Jose podcast and the Tower Gang podcast. Go get the links for it down below. We talk about the Oklahoma City bombing and much, much more. Today's a crazy ass podcast. You're going to heck and love it. All right, welcome to a brand new episode of No More Heroes. I'm your host, Andy Malfrey, and today we have another very special guest uh, from the No Way Jose podcast, Jose Garrison. I mumbled the shit out of that because I forgot how to say it. How you doing, Jose? Doing good, doing good. Uh, glad to come on with you. I've seen you around on Twitter, seen you, seen some of your stand-up bits. They're pretty funny. I'm glad to be oh, here. Oh, hell yeah, dude. Yeah. Hell yeah, man. I, I'm glad to be here. Oh, <laughs> yeah. How, how, um... I wanted to start off by asking you, how does it feel uh, to have the best Tim cast appearance out of the Tower Gang guys? <laughs> Feels great. Although Tim or Clint is on right now, I've caught some of it. He's on with Josie of uh, the the redheaded libertarian. Oh, is he, he on right to, now? He's on right now. Uh, it's it's a. Yeah, I caught some of it. It seems to be pretty good. They seem to be. It's more of a laid back. I mean, I don't know. They seem to. I don't know. Like so far as the topics, I mean, I kind of was you know, fast forwarding through a lot, but. I don't know. I still think uh, me and Reed had a better one so far, but I don't know. He's still, I'm only got like halfway through it, so they they still got time. But it was still good. It's still a good episode. So so just going to see it. But well, yeah. no, I was laughing because I was I was uh, checking out the latest Tower Gang you guys had, and um, you guys were you guys were joking about that, and it was it was funny where Tim's like, "Yo, we're gonna talk about Steven Crowder <laughs> for the whole time," and then like, didn't it come out that Steven Crowder was kind of being like a sneaky dickhead or whatever? Something like that. I didn't even follow it that much. The funny thing is, like, we actually, because, I mean, you know, it's a current event show, so we all kind of were, like, talking amongst ourselves, like, the day before each of our appearances and kind of like, hey, what's the hot news? And we, like, we we saw that happening. And I don't, I think it was uh, uh, Fat Dave that led him, like, sent the link and was like, hey, they're probably going to talk about this because, like, this is new. Because we, I mean, I don't know about you, but I don't normally really care about, like, current events type stuff, the type of stuff Tim Castro normally covers, um, you know, so... Like I even like me, I'm even less so. Like I, I like to talk about like theory a lot, and then I also like to talk about like conspiracies. But usually, even then, typically stuff that's like a little bit in the past. Like, uh, you know, like I'm big, big in the OKC. I'm kind of also big on like the Michigan kidnapping stuff too. Uh, the, the not the kidnapping, but the kidnapping conspiracy plot of Gretchen Whitmer or whatever. I've covered a decent amount of that. And like, yeah, we just, yeah. I just had um Radix on. You just had Radix on. Yep, I just had Radix on too. She's great. Yeah, yeah she's awesome. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. yeah, uh, so I mean, that's not necessarily my thing. So, like, whenever we were like both of us can are both of these groups getting ready to go on, it's kind of like, what is the current event thing? Like, what are the the topics all the normies are talking about right now? Because it's like in our heads, we're like, well, you know, what what it takes are we gonna have? And then are like also then kind of like, can we somehow like make that take kind of divert into something we're about? like and, and yeah that was one that came up and uh they we had I, I i like to think that we all had some interesting angles on it i've forgotten more pretty much damn near all of that stuff because so, i don't really care about crowder and daily wire fighting but we, we had an interesting angle and then they didn't go that angle <laughs> so not not clinton top because uh, uh in that episode um yeah Tim definitely kind of took the reins there and uh, went to town. Uh, but, you know, I don't know, whatever. It's it, A lot of people like to complain. I, I don't know. I don't really complain. It was great that, you know, we got to go on. I mean, don't get me wrong. Like, a lot of people gave me crap when I got on that, like, we didn't spend the whole time talking about Oklahoma City or something or talking about our stuff. But he doesn't run an interview show. That's not what he does. He has a current events show. He brings you on. You talk about current events, and if you can somehow get yourself in there, that's cool. But in the day, you're now, you know, I got in more than I expected to, so I was happy and you know got a little boost, you know. So it's great, whatever, you know. <laughs> yeah, people, it is what it is. <laughs> people act like people act like, too, especially Tim Cass has like, there's like six or seven of you guys, and people act like it's super easy to just hijack like the topic of the podcast, and like you'd hop in there and be like, "All right, do you guys want to talk about this conspiracy theory from the '90s real quick?" <laughs> exactly like, no i thought that's that's um i was listening to your guys's tim cast and that was half the reason that was half the reason i wanted to uh hit you up and talk to you because like i like doing more stuff like this um i like 
I like talking about this stuff because I find it all very interesting, but I don't know. I don't know if I'd be good in those settings. Like whenever I see the cable news stuff, I'm like, that seems nerve wracking because it's so fucking rapid fire. And then Tim Cash, you got so many people. So like, did you, were you going into that nervous? Like what, what's it like, like actually getting on there? Is it kind of like a mind fuck? Cause you know how many people are watching and do you got to do a lot of prep and shit? Uh, I didn't really, I, it wasn't a mind fuck for me. It's funny because uh, I don't know if you follow the Tower Gang a lot. We definitely talked talked about this a little bit. A lot of people were giving me crap. Uh, they were like, he is going to be such anxious energy. Because, like, I, I've always, my whole life, I've been kind of the kind of guy who, uh, like, my, like, in school, I was the guy who never studied, almost hardly ever did homework, like, kind of, sort of paid attention in class, but then, like, day of test, ace, like, every time. Like, that was the kind of guy I was, I was lazy, but I was smart. But I yeah. always knew that, like, I had in my my head that, like, if I really wanted to perform on something, all I had to do was prep. And I prepped, And but I, I'm also really good at turning it off. I'm really good at not giving a fuck the day of. <laughs> like, that's just how I am because that's – and it's weird. I've always said when it comes to, like, say, tests or just performing in general, it is like a balancing of giving a fuck. Like, you got you to gotta give a fuck enough. I mean, it depends on the person because for me, like I said, I'm obviously – I I don't know if I'm, – I'm not trying to blow myself, but, like, I guess – Maybe I guess I'm kind of smart, I don't know, or something. But I'm like, but it, it's a balancing act of giving a fuck to prepare, or at least you know, know you know the stuff, and then the day of, you got to not give a fuck enough to you know perform because if you, you kind of just got to go to almost like a you know a muscle memory in a sense at that point. Uh, and for me, I did. I prepped like. I mean, I guess I would say like crazy because I'm a busy guy, but like pretty much any moment that I wasn't working or spending with my family. And even then when I work, I usually like have like headphones in and stuff. I was like listening and most of my prep was my OKC stuff. I was re-listening my entire series, which is like 10 hours. I was like taking notes. I called Richard Booth, who's the guy I had on for my OKC series. We like we sat down. We kind of I made I had bullet points that I'd already made up. And then I kind of had him to kind of like, you know, bump back and forth like, hey, how can I make these notes better? Uh, you know, what are, what are like key points that like on the off chance I get to actually drop this, like, what can I do? And then, you know, it sounds insane, you know, like all this prep, but then like <laughs> the day of like, or, or no, actually what I did is like, I think a couple days out, I knew like I needed to calm my nerves a little bit before then I just chilled. I stopped. I I, I think I just stopped even listening to like libertarian podcasts or anything. I was just listening. I was just bumping music at work, uh, you know, like, uh, smoking weed, just chilling. Like in in because to kind of get in that chill vibe and then day of I it was like for me I felt like I found a perfect perfect mix where I prepped like crazy and then a few days out just chilled and then I just kind of just do what I do and I, I don't know I didn't I mean don't be wrong there was a little bit of like whoa this is pretty dope like I was, I was across the room from the lead singer of all the remains which like for any like guys are in that kind of music like it's pretty dope like for me yeah. I, and I am like because that's 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 my dude like he was probably. Like so far as like albums that have like uh, meant the most to me, you know, especially nostalgia wise, like Fall of Ideals is like top three. <laughs> like, so I was like, yo, that's pretty dope. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I, I don't know. It was fun time. Uh, but yeah, I definitely everyone does differently. Reed didn't prep at all. Like I actually kind of, you know, you know, almost forced him to prep a little bit before the uh, Tim cast. You show up at a like a hotel type thing that they drop you off at to set your stuff up, then they pick you back up later. So all, it's literally like a, a tiny little. It's kind of funny because you would like never expect this to be like where Tim Cass keeps all his guests, or, you know, because it's like literally like a hole in the wall motel. I'm not saying it's a bad place, but it just seems like a country motel, just off the beaten path type thing. And it's like connected harder for to a Antifa diner. to find and raid. Uh, yeah, <laughs> exactly. And uh, it's like attached to a diner. And I remember me and Reed just kind of going over, not like crazy, but kind of being like, hey, you know, like what are the, you know, two, like one to three things that if you could, you'd really like to be able to hit. And how can we get these to be concise? That way you can just drop them. And yeah, and that's we kind of went over them. And then we also were kind of like, all right, well, what's your intro plug? What's your outro plug? Because those are probably like the most important, especially your intro so yeah. you know because that's what really your first impression and i th think we did well uh, i don't know what top and clint's if they really did much prep or what i mean definitely we were talking the group chats and stuff kind of scheming and stuff uh and yeah i don't know they turned out well uh i think uh yeah they just got kind of the bad luck of the draw with the, 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 the crowder story <laughs> which i mean whatever you, it's, it's tim show that's what he wanted to talk about that day 
<laughs> yeah, fuck it, shit happens. Clint's ba- Clint's back on today. Hopefully, Top gets yeah. back on again. Yo, you were talking. You said a you said a thing earlier that I uh, I wanted to hit on because I was thinking about this. Um, you were talking about prepping for Timcast. Like, I know you know I know your big things. Okay, see, and I want to get to it at uh, at some point in the podcast. And so I was listening to I was listening to your series. I got through as much of it as I could. Um, and be and I say that because. Like I said, last week I interviewed Radix. I read a, I was listening to a shit ton about that. I actually, I was listening to your episode with her and you kept throwing out that book. What's it called? Terror Factory? Terror Factory, Trevor Aronson. It's a good book. Yeah. Yeah. I got through a lot of that and yeah. that was, a, that was a lot of info. And then jumping off from the FBI stuff to now just over. And I knew a bunch about OKC, so I was like revisiting and it's that thing where like it's 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 i'm into this stuff but it's a lot <laughs> it is a lot yeah it is a and lot so like that that <laughs> chilling that chilling is so important i guess the question i want to ask you sort of in that context is like yeah like like how do you how do you like i don't know compartmentalize or whatever like how do you break up the stuff for yourself because that's the problem i run into like i remember when i first became a libertarian i hit that first phase where you're like wait what like you just like (laughs) learned all this new stuff and you're like what the fuck and i feel like because i just recently like i think like a month ago i sat down i go fuck i think i'm an ancap shit and now like i'm going through a whole nother phase with things so like what's what do you do to kind of like i don't know like trick through all this nonsense Uh, i i don't know it's just kind of what I generally just kind of find stuff I'm interested in and just then go explore them. And having a podcast is actually kind of a good outlet for this because it allows me to. Because, for example, with the OKC thing, how it worked out for me is I'd kind of like sort of like growing up, I'd known about OKC. I didn't really know there was any other like crazy elements to it. And I think like kind of as I became a libertarian, I kind of heard little murmurs here and there that maybe there was more. And at one point, I saw Jinx, who is a uh, Twitter, uh, you know, used to be an account. He still is on there, but he's a different one. I think it's at three Mason or something now. Yeah, something uh, like that. Yeah, I asked him by the way if that was cool if I plugged, uh, you know, a while back because I know he's kind of a schizo, so I was always worried that he'd be upset, you know, because you're trying to ban evade, you know. And he's like, I don't care. So whatever. But he, Jinx he used to be at Crack Connoisseur. I think he was something ridiculous, like almost 100k follows. Uh, followers you know he's great but he had he dropped this edit uh which was a terrence Hickey edit and that just like that fucked with me like like if you i don't know if you've seen the edit uh like the this this, i remember catching it a while ago and i think i had because yeah the the, the, and and the terrence um terrence Zeke thing has kind of been like your thing because it's like every every conspiracy has that you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like the nine eleven. Like there's a lot of stuff in nine eleven, but like I remember the one for me was uh was a uh, uh, building seven, and you're like, wait, what the fuck? How that yeah. fucking how that fucking fall? And like that's kind of how it is for OKC when you see um and how do you say his last name? Zeke? Yeeky, Terrence Yeeky, yeah. Yeeky. When you see the whole Terrence Yeeky thing, it's one of those things where it's like, yeah, he uh. You know, it's like commit. Well, you know what? I'll let you break it down because it's fucking wild. <laughs> yeah, he uh, he fucking. What did he do? He he slit his wrists. He cut his throat. I think he was stabbed in the side or the neck or something. He uh, he had a rope burns. He had uh, he had bruises from handcuffs. Likely, he had grass in his in dirt in the wounds. And somehow he ended up a mile and a half away from his uh his vehicle that was covered in over two two pints of his blood. Oh yeah, I forgot the bullet in the head, which is also the the big aspect of the bullet in the head was that it was at a weird angle. It was like kind of like this, which like I know I guess theoretically you could like shoot yourself like that, but this is like a very weird way to do it. And then also Super there's hard. an aspect of the gunshot residue where it shows it wasn't like to the head; it was like further, like so, yeah. like. You, like but that, I mean, obviously that's not like something I usually bring up because that's like if you're trying to be concise about it, uh, you know, if you're doing it on Twitter or just trying to drop it on like Timcast or something. But yeah, no, that's that's the one that hooked me in, and it is it is good. Like Building Seven is a good example. Uh, I'm not a huge 911 guy. Uh, I mean, I've kind of got dabbled in there, but I know, like, I'm sure there's probably people out there upset and bringing up Building Seven, like, well, oh, this is why. I don't know. I don't care. I'm just saying, I get why people are like, what the fuck, Building Seven fell? Like, it's weird. It's yeah. weird, undeniably. Like, what? No matter what your take is on that, it's weird. Uh, and fuck it with the Yiki thing, it's weird. But then also, like, the big thing for the Yiki thing is, it's like. It's a hook in that it's weird, and there's an emotional aspect. 
Like the dude was legit trying, like the, if you look into his story and what it looks like, what happened, uh, you know, what the, what the sources there are seem to heavily imply is that he did not buy the official narrative. He was one of the first responders of OKC, one of the first people who showed up. Uh, he saved at least four people. He got, he got injured in the process. He was a cop, right? Yeah, he was a cop, uh, which kind of makes, I know for a lot of ANCAPs, like, oh, fucking all cops are bad. And like, yeah, okay, I get that. But like, also, like, this one was trying not to be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, like, uh, they, which kind of, if anything, tugs at my heart a little bit more because it's like, dude, tried not to. It might, might yeah. audio just get weird all of a sudden. It's good for me. Uh, but, anyways. Over here. All right, man, fucking, I'm all, my shit in my ears, wigging me out. But yeah, no, he, uh, he fucking, yeah, he was trying to do the right thing. It looks like he didn't buy the official narrative. There's a whole lot more to it. I, I highly suggest people go check out my series, but if you want to know about Yiki, specifically check out episode seven if you just want to know about Yiki, uh, episode seven of the OKC series. I have a whole playlist on my channel if you want to check it out. But yeah, he, uh, yeah, it looked like he was trying to do the right thing. It looked like he may have been collecting evidence of some sort. And yeah, then magically he got, oh, I don't even think I mentioned earlier that, that death, he was ruled a suicide. I left that out. That's kind of the key point. It like was almost immediately ruled a suicide. And yeah, he was clearly trying to do the right thing. He was a, you know, kind of, a, I don't know how long you've been on the force, something like five to 10 years ish, kind of that middle range, you know, wasn't quite like, you know, middle or upper management, still kind of a beat cop is what it seemed like. Uh, so, you know, it, it tugs on people's heartstrings. He had kids. He had a ex-wife that he it looked like they, you know, were at least friendly, if not even maybe like me, like mending things. Maybe there may have been more. Like he, lit, one of the big key things is he was actually trying to get her to marry him again near the end, but like in a way of like, hey, for life insurance purposes. <laughs> and that was one of the things that threw, like, made her be like, "What the hell? Like, what is going on here?" And it's like, "You need to marry me," because <laughs> of the oh, idea. Like he's. He was concerned about that something would happen to him is what it seemed. The big thing that makes it hard is he, he didn't really ever explicitly say anything. He heavily implied things to people because, and the, the thing that I seem to think, and you know, is that because of the fact, especially with his ex-wife, with her having his kids, it's like she, he didn't want to endanger them. If they had, if they know too much, they, they could be in danger. But yeah, there was definitely a lot of weird stuff that was happening there. It seems to heavily apply. He did tell his his uh, ex wife Tanya Yiki. She's actually done a full on interview, which uh, I don't remember where it was at. I'm sure if anyone asks, I can find it for them, or or Richard Booth or somebody can. Uh, I've definitely got it if I dig for it somewhere. But she did a whole f- full on interview on the radio back shortly after it happened, and uh, yeah, she she said that he straight up told her like Tanya, this is not it's not what they're saying it is. Like that was one of the first things he said to her when he got out of the hospital after the uh, incident because he did get injured in the process. And he was very much hastily trying to get out of there. He did not want to be in the hospital. It seemed to be that, you know, he had people hassling him there already from the moment he was there. I don't know if it was superiors, what. It's a very weird story. And it's like this was a guy who was just trying to do good things or was trying to do the right thing. Uh, You know, some messed up stuff was going on. And he got suicide. (laughs) So, yeah. So was he like, was he kind of, how did, how did they catch on that he was starting to like figure it out? Was he like very public in press conferences or was he kind of talking to his commanders and then word got to, you know, some shadowy figures and then boom, get suicided? Well, I mean, obviously we only have a few sources that really, uh, you know, I think you have his ex-wife i think there might be some stuff with his mother obviously some other people uh there was also a letter he sent to a friend uh i forget who they were but i guess it was another person that was kind of interested in stuff and i know at one point in the letter to the friend he said something along the lines of that he talked to the chaplain which i don't know if you've ever been uh like if you're a prior military or anything like that, or uh, like the concept behind a chaplain. And I, I don't know, maybe it's different for cops. Uh, I'd assume it's probably similar, uh, you know, for military, you have chaplains and uh, they're, they're, they're basically kind of religious figures. Usually how it works on a military bases, they try to have one of each kind that they possibly can within reason uh, on base. And uh, essentially there's someone you can go to if you're having troubles. Obviously you can go in for spiritual things, emotional, whatever. There's supposed to be someone you can talk to and you can, mm. and they're, they're, the whole point of them is they're not supposed to go and like tell your commanding officers or anybody anything. And supposedly that, uh, that uh, chaplain, you know, told everything. 
uh, supposedly. Uh, wow. So uh, you'd have to read the letter. If you check out my episode in the uh, video description, there's an article that uh, that's in there that kind of, I think it plays out, it has the letter in there, I believe, and also a bunch of other stuff. You know, it's the, the article does better job than my podcast did on it, but obviously some people prefer podcasts over reading articles, so, you know, it is what it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit of a long article, not too long, though, So, but it's probably the best uh, source you'll find for specifically Yiki, that article that's in the video description, so... Okay, so um, what what kind what kind of stuff was he, what kind of stuff was he finding out? Because I know for me, I'm not like crazy from it. Like, I know the general, uh, uh, like the general bones of OKC, but then I'm sort of like, I don't know. It's sort of hard for me to like piece together because I know they'll they'll say like um, they'll say like um, oh god, what was his name again? Um, the Yiki? bomber. Oh, the bomber, uh, McVeigh, Timothy McVeigh. McVeigh, that's right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. They'll say like McVeigh was a patsy or stuff like that, and then, yeah, there's like a whole bunch of different. What, what was he finding out that made him go like, "Oh shit, this isn't the <laughs> the shit they say it is." Uh, Yiki. Well, he never explicitly said. Uh, I believe, if I recall. Uh, there are, have been people who have re looked into it that, uh, God, I'm kind of talking to my ass a little bit here. I believe there were people saying that he may have somehow gotten a hold of the surveillance tapes, which <laughs> that's a big key point of OKC is that there were all the surveillance tapes magically disappeared. Uh, you know, oopsies gone. And, uh, you know, yeah. uh, so I want to say there was something like 23 surveillance. Uh, they There was, and this is like stuff that's come out in court documents that they've proven they did exist. Uh, I want to say it was like something like 23 or more or something like that. At least 23 that were, you know, showed the Murrah building, which is a building that exploded. And I think at least two of them uh, actually showed like the bombing itself and would have shown like the rider truck because that's a big key aspect of it is there were with the... For the two separate things, two key aspects, the explosion itself, it, it, you know, because one big point of this is like, was it literally just the rider truck uh, that exploded? You know, the uh, was it like ammonium nitrate, like basically a fertilizer bomb. Was that really what destroyed this whole building? Because I know for me, I, I mean, I don't really assert anything on that front because I'm not an explosive expert, but and I've it's kind of hard to suss out what's right, what's there. There's good arguments on both sides. Uh, but so I don't normally lead with the explosive stuff, but it does seem a little suspicious to me. If you like look into how the building was, how far away the truck was, the aspect that a, a you know, a fertilizer thing would be like, just take that building out like that. Eh, it's a little much. There's also been some reports that they, they there were eyewitnesses that saw the, the, I think there were two eyewitnesses that said they saw people like a week or so prior look like they were putting putty type of material uh, up on um, like on different beams and stuff, which yeah. would imply like planning explosives, uh, kind of the idea that they set off a truck bomb and then it made it look like, and then also simultaneously did that. That way it's like to kind of make sure they actually got it. Uh, but then the other aspect would be, you know, you know, aside from the explosives for why, or what he could have seen from that is the John Doe 2. Because there were multiple eyewitnesses who saw John Doe 2. Oh, my God, I wish I could remember the numbers off the top of my head. Uh, uh, but, you know, that's definitely more Richard Booth's spot. But there were a, a shitload, I'll say that, a shitload <laughs> of eyewitnesses that saw uh, John Doe 2. Like, to a point to where it's like, it's kind of hard to hand wave it away because I know a lot of time with eyewitnesses will be like, well, I don't know, eyewitnesses are a little bit funky, but it's like, no, a bunch of people describe this exact looking person <laughs> and yeah, seeing it like, before I... the bombing and after the bombing, like in that time period. Like, yeah, because so. eyewit eyewitness accounts can be like untrustworthy when you're trying to get like specifics of it, but if it's just something like there was a second guy, yeah. Like and and a bunch of people all say that, then that adds like a decent amount of credibility. So you're saying, oh yeah, that's like the big sticking point because they try to say McVeigh was doing it by himself, but you're saying a lot of people saw someone with him before mm. and after the explosion. Yes, and and they typically describe him as a you know semi the same uh, kind of like a guy with my kind of build, maybe a couple inches taller, a little bit darker complexion, you know, kind of that like. Uh, 
could have been Hispanic, could have been a light skinned black dude, like a really light skinned black dude, could have been a dark skinned white dude, could have been a Italian dude, you know, like yeah. kind of that racially ambiguous type look, uh, you know, muscular, uh, you know, so and 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 there are other people that are kind of if once you start going down this rabbit hole other people that are like clearly associates of of um of mcveigh's that are definitely likely probably had or not even likely they almost a lot of them certainly did had some you know part in this plot and you know the the like the, the other stuff outside of it and not really any of them really fit the bill of that guy so that is like kind of like that's why like he's kind of elusive thing like even there wasn't this like one guy they're like ooh so the, the John Doe 2 thing is kind of this mysterious like who is it we don't know it's always been the thing it's also weird how they dropped it so quickly uh like they made a huge deal of it at first and then I, I want to say it was something ridiculous when like a month or two they were like yep no just kidding there was no John Doe 2 yeah, like they were talking about <laughs> it on the news and everything yeah it was they made and then they were just like it. he's not there we were yep, kidding nope, jk nope, nope. lol yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah because that you know that changes the whole thing uh if there was a guy helping him or yeah. not um oh yeah also i, I would just want to add even if yiki didn't have like actual physical evidence maybe if he was trying to collect some because that's a big part of his a lot of people think is like he always carried documents he always this there are things that seem to imply he may have been collecting evidence but even if he wasn't he was one of the first people to show up I do think he at one point made some sort of statement about how it was weird that the ATF was already there and somehow got there before him. <laughs> so like, uh, or, or just how, people, huh? How quickly did he get there? I think he was literally one, if not the first one of the very first, like he was basically like one of the first responders. So in, in the literal sense, not in the like first responder, cause you're just generically a cop. Like he literally yeah. was one of the first responders. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> he was like the first guy. Okay. <laughs> Um, so I'm, I'm the, the, with the OKC, like in Timothy McVeigh, a big thing is, um, they like, cause a lot of people try to say he's like a patsy or whatever. And it's like, it's always weird. Um, like sort of sorting that out where how much, how, how am I trying to ask this? Cause it's like, cause you think it's like, wait, so does he know he's gonna like go down for this from the beginning or like, how does that. Or I should I should ask like do you think he was a patsy? Uh, do you what do you mean in a patsy sense? Like just the guy who took the blame and that was it? Yeah, like he was like, gonna, like he didn't necessarily do it or or that he did like do he it. He was or, gonna yeah. Either, they or. were like they had some things set up. There he was gonna take the blame and then at the last minute they fucked him over. Uh, well, I guess. I don't know if he thought he was getting out. It, there definitely are uncertainties. Like if he thought he was going to get away with it or not. I do think he did it. But now I think yeah. the key thing is that like there were people that helped him. And then the other key thing is like now in what what was McVeigh? Was he just some racist guy or you know who was all about militia stuff because he was a legit part of like an actual like white supremacist like movement like legit one? Uh, like I am always hesitant to use that label because it's like so overused, but he was like legit. Um, and, and that decided to blow it up, blow up some federal building because he was upset about Waco and Ruby Ridge and all that. Or, and was it organic or was he a full on like fed asset or was yeah. it something in between to where like it could, it could have been a thing where he was this crazy guy who you know genuinely wanted to blow up a federal building because he hated them for what they did and there were also people you know orchestrating things from the outside kind of pushing things certain ways and manipulating them that were almost certainly assets uh because now i don't know there i will say he there are sources uh i don't know if they're, i believe there it's like a physical letter or something i know it's his sister his mother his first attorneys he told he told them that he was because his thing is he joined that he was in the military uh i believe it was I believe it was like desert storm i think that was the time he was in or something uh and then whenever he got done with his time like actually at war in desert storm like he legit was killing people and stuff and he came back and he went to go for a special force went to go special forces i don't remember specifically which one or what 
And then when he got there, I guess uh, the the official story is that he had foot issues, uh, you know, from his time when he was, you know, overseas, you know, actually in war, it caused some problems, which, you know, it's, you know, that's actually a pretty good excuse because uh, if anyone's done any special force training, uh, if you know, if you know I, I was 11 years active duty, I actually initially went for like something that was more along those lines, like special forces, I failed out when I first joined and it became becoming a mechanic. But like when I was there, I had to like, ruck around with 70 pound rucksacks for like five to 15 miles, depending on the day, uh, you know, all sorts of craziness and yeah, that stuff's heavy. And if you have, are having feet problems, that's, it's, it's going to be rough. You're, yeah. it's not going to work out for, well for you. So, uh, plausible, uh, plausible excuse. So, but according to him, uh, you know, you know, his sources, uh, being his sister, his mother and his first attorneys, this is a story he told his first attorneys is that, Whenever he got there, instead of him just failing out, uh, you know, because of the foot thing, they actually took him aside and said, hey, uh, I don't know if it was due to a psychological profile or what. They're like, hey, we think you're a perfect candidate for this other thing we got going on. And essentially what it will be is that you will go off books and no longer be in in the military on the books. You're going to tell the official story will be, here's your foot thing. This is why you got out. This is what we're going to tell everyone. This is this is what your story is. And but really what we're going to have you do is we're going to have you, I guess, kind of generically do what we want. There was kind of vague things like uh, I guess they implied that he would you know be in some aspect doing stuff along the lines of assisting with uh, like moving drugs for the feds, assistance for that kind of, you know, how like if you've gone down these type of rabbit holes, you know, that is it's not even really a conspiracy theory at this point. It's basically it's fact that the feds have used. Uh, drugs, especially, you know, if you can look in Afghanistan and the all opium stuff, they've used drugs to, um, Oh yeah. They do... just, uh, new season of that show snowfall just came out. <laughs> like it's a f- TV show on Fed, uh, FX. What am I saying? Yeah. FedEx. It's a hundred percent thing. The feds do is they use, use that drug money as off books money, but they were also like, you're just going to be like generically kind of our operative. And I, I don't know the specifics because it's just kind of like this is just stuff he told his mom and stuff in letters and his attorneys. I don't remember the exact specifics of what exactly he said he was going to do, but essentially an oh, off the so book type operative. So, him, okay. So him like being that asset where they're like, yo, we don't want you to do this, but yo, let's have you do this. And the, like, that's confirmed in the context of conversations he's had and letters yeah. he's. So he could just sent. be a crazy person making up bullshit. Like sure. he the sources. Hundred you know, percent. Like yeah. I don't. I don't know. It is weird that because uh, the big thing is like I said, his first attorneys like after the bombing when he got and I believe I want to say he kind of said stuff like this to the cops or whatever. Maybe it was his attorneys, but essentially this was his initial story whenever he first got picked up by the by the by the uh, police and stuff, or yeah. was dealing with his lawyers, whatever. Initially, that was his story. And then shortly after, all of a sudden, you know, in any sort of a, like when he was dealing with any sort of official capacity, people like, you know, lawyers, uh, you know, press, whatever, it was all of a sudden the official narrative. But he was still even then, I think, you know, saying to other people, you know, more in a casual sense, you know, like not when it's on the on the books type thing. Yeah, no, that's kind of what's going on. Like, this is what's really going on. <laughs> like, so yeah. it is like, what, what, what the fuck is going on here? Like, wh- what happened? Like, what, why? So it is weird. I don't know. He could just be a crazy person. I, I, I don't know. The weird thing is too is he did basically expl- like he essentially when he got taken in, he basically gave them, told them what they were about. Essentially described what is now be called PatCon. Uh, and also he did, he kind of described that drug thing I told you. And you got to think in the context of like, what was it? 95, 96, like they're going to be like, like it, it is a weird thing to think about of like, if someone said that now you'd be like, oh, they're just latching on to these like conspiracy facts, things that actually happen. And they're just saying shit. But for some crazy person to say this stuff at that time is like mm. weird because that wasn't a thing in the mainstream it was just weird, crazy shit that just so happened to like over decades later, people were like, now the common person is like, yeah, that's the thing that happens. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You have things like, uh, I know P- Pat con, most people don't know about, but a lot of people know about like COINTELPRO or just the fact that the feds infiltrate all sorts of movements, which essentially Pat con is something that's been confirmed at this point, which where they were infiltrating right wing movements, particularly stuff like militias or white supremacist type stuff, like things of that ilk. And yeah. that was what's heavily implied, likely, you know, possibly what McVeigh may have been doing. 
Yeah, and yeah, no, that's a good point. That's a good point. I remember you bringing that up um, during your series where you were saying, yeah, it's like, it's like a lot of people know about this stuff now, but he was saying this before no one knew about drug running. No one knew about, you know, the FBI like getting into shit like that. So it's like either he, you know, it's either he's super creative or he was <laughs> letting them know what they had him do. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'll be honest. Uh, I lean towards that, but I will be I'll be up front in like an academic sense of like, OK, it's not rock solid. Like, I mean, there's no like supporting documents or anything. It's literally just things he told people. That's it. So all yeah. we have is what Mc, the word of McVeigh to, you know, people, people that were kind of close to him. And that's it. Yeah. So and I OKC's... don't know. Maybe, maybe he's a compulsive liar. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. No, OKC is hard because it's like you're like, I could see column A. I could also see column B. Like they're both reasonable. Yeah. But either, either way, at the end of the day, like even if he wasn't a Fed asset of some sort, there were people around him who were clearly fed assets to the point where you're like, yeah, dude, the, the dude's a fed. Like, I, I, don't, I don't even really have to like tiptoe around it and be like, oh, well, let's be like Andy Strassmeyer, like, uh, like that guy, fucking fed. <laughs> like, like, uh, yeah. Who, who was he again? We, give a little context on him again. Andy Strassmeyer. He was the son of a pretty big politician in Germany. He joined the military in Germany. He became a, he essentially got trained in like counter intel over there. Uh, he is also at some point was training with the Israelis and, you know, for a small period of time, it was almost like seemed like it was some sort of cross training thing. Like he wasn't actually part of the IDF, but he was like kind of training with them and he was literally on secu security pat uh, patrols with them. He spoke fluent German, fluent English, fluent Hebrew, spent a lot of time in Israel. Uh, he then ended up coming over to, he ended up at some point coming over to the United States. I'm just trying to make sure I'm not forgetting anything. And when he came over to the United States, he immediately was uh, lived with a C CIA guy. I forget. Uh, fuck, I forget his name. Wish I could remember off the top of my head. But stayed with one CIA guy for a while. Uh, then after a while doing that, then he moved lived, moved in with another guy who was a, the official CIA guy. Oh, I forgot the previous CIA guy. God, I wish I could remember his fucking name. I might have in my notes somewhere. But... Anyways, that guy, the, crew, the the weird thing about him is he was part of the first CIA guy he lived with who was part of Operation Phoenix in Vietnam, which a lot of people don't know about that, but apparently what Operation Phoenix was was essentially Operation Northwards in Vietnam, uh, which anyone who's in Operation Northwards was is when they were trying to like, you know, do essentially red flag type stuff to the American people, uh, blame it on the Cubans and kind of, you know, uh, that way they could call for a war with Cuba. It, it got it got slapped down by JFK and then conveniently and shortly died after. But, uh, you know, <laughs> I don't know. Take that as you will. He also did a lot of other stuff that kind of shook up, shook up things and then died shortly after. So it may not even have been that or it could have been one of the things. But either yeah, way. Take your pick, dude. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he did no, a lot of shit to piss off people. <laughs> I'm, glad you, uh, I'm glad you brought up Operation Northwood because that is – Cause like you know, um, I have a lot. I have a lot of friends who aren't into this shit, and sometimes you get some eye rolls. And I go Google Operation Northwood, and a lot yeah. of shit. You know, you won't be convinced of everything, but if you look up Operation Northwood, a lot of other shit gets less crazy to you. Yeah. I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah, and then Operation North. A lot of people don't realize with Operation Northwoods. For one, I guess there's the angle of like, okay, yeah, they didn't do it, but did they really not do it? I don't know. But anyways, <laughs> this has also been, it's essentially been done other places. Like Operation Gladio is like essentially Operation Northwoods that happened over in Europe. I forget specifically where, where they did the same exact thing. I forget what the goal was, but they did it in Vietnam as well. I forget what the goal was, who they were trying to like, uh, you know, inflame tensions against. I forget who it was, but this CIA guy was part of that operation. And, you know, he had made comments, too, about how he'd like to start up something like that, you know, kind of, you know, get the gang back together type thing, you know, do it all over again. One more job. <laughs> <laughs> do it in the United States. I mean, we don't know the specifics of what he was getting at, what his ends were, who he's trying to anything. And yeah. which, you know, and the things that they they specialize in was assassinations, bombings, uh, you know, stuff like that. Whoop you do look where we're at now. And then anyways. <laughs> that was the one interesting guy with the first CIA guy I stayed with. I forget his name. I'm going to think of it later and be like, fuck. Uh, but, and then he had the, then he then went to another CIA guy shortly after and lived with him. And this was in Texas. That guy was someone who had formed a militia, that CIA guy. Uh, and then all, I think, then he kind of brought Strassmeyer into the fold to kind of be part of that militia. 
I believe it was that militia. That was the first time he met McVeigh. Was at that place. Um, is at that uh, militia. I forget the name of it, but and also the Strassmeyer got kicked out of that militia because. Fucking people, the people in that militia, I forget where they saw him going into, but they, they saw him going somewhere really weird. They essentially followed him because they were kind of had suspicions because this guy was like kind of immediately like, you know what we should do? We should blow up federal buildings and shit like that. You know, like just saying stuff like that, kind of like, who the fuck is this guy? <laughs> <laughs> and so they, they, they started following him, tailed them. He, I don't remember exactly where, I think he went somewhere. They were like, I don't, it was definitely going to highly highly implied that he was a fed i don't know if it was a federal building of some sort or where yeah. i don't know the specifics of it but they followed his ass and then they're like get the fuck out <laughs> and they Knock kicked it, it off, out dude and then shortly after that he ended up in elohim city which is now it's getting back to you know kind of tying into things uh he ended up in elohim city which is kind of the hub of a lot of this okc stuff because mm -hmm. elohim city was kind of like a compound where all of these white supremacists are kind of actually like were holding shop type deal. Like this is where they were hanging out at. This is where you know, McVeigh was at a lot. He kind of like had a lot of associates of these people. A lot of other people seem to have a part in this, you know, plot. And then, you know, Strassmeyer ends up there. He ends up become like the security of their, uh, or the director of their security. He immediately then, you know, makes the changes, all their guns to like illegal weapons. Uh, it starts like preaching more about like, you know, being a more offensive, uh, yeah, and there's also multiple other, you know, sightings of him with McVeigh. He only, he only ever confirmed one with him. Uh, but yeah, there it's it's heavily. Uh, I which episode? That was episode two of my series. So one of people, yeah. you, you can't. I I struggle to believe that someone could come away from that episode and be like, yeah, that dude's that dude's not a fed. Like if you think <laughs> that he's not a fed after that, you're not really thinking too hard. <laughs> <laughs> wait, you said wait wait you said change got him to change all their guns to illegal guns. Like automatic weapons, shit. <laughs> God damn. Not all yeah, of them, but like a lot of them. So he was like, he was changing up their armory. Be like, you know what we should get? Illegal guns. <laughs> <laughs> all these guns, they're super fucking legal. That's lame. You know what we should do, guys? Let's make. A yeah, that's uh. If you're ever with a group of people for political reasons, and one of them tries to get you to do illegal shit, get them the heck out of there. <laughs> I mean, I guess it depends what we're talking about. But yeah, like if it's like shit like that, you're like, oh fuck. <laughs> <laughs> trying to smoke a doobie with you don't be like get the fuck out of here Finn. <laughs> oh yeah yeah i should yeah you know what yeah that's that's a good clarification when it's uh when it when it's a legal shit that leans violent then you uh then you need to start following them and asking them questions <laughs> yeah so yeah stress meyer um that was a dude who hung out with him or did that shit a lot too um yeah there's also roger moore who is the dude that they so he was the guy who actually was a star witness uh, one of the star witnesses against timothy mcveigh in court um essentially what happened is timothy mcveigh and terry nichols who was kind of like his accomplice um you know basically terry mcveigh or timothy mcveigh's bitch essentially um you know, tim uh, terry nichols uh fucking stole or you know basically came to roger moore kind of stole uh, you know came to him and was like hey uh, I'm going to steal from you. And this is something they've, I guess, a guy that like interacted with a bunch before. He had a bunch of guns, a bunch of stuff like that. And it was, I, I don't recollect a lot about that one. I forget which episode it is. So people have to go back and check it. But essentially it was definitely not a real robbing. It was definitely like an orchestrated robbery. That way it was like plausible deniability. And they got a lot of stuff off them that, that would kind of like be able to procure funds for the bombing and stuff like that. Uh, yeah. But this guy also is someone with a very deep, uh, rich history of, uh glowing a lot <laughs> there's a Ooh, like he he was you, huh? sorry can you um i i you you guys kept saying that i was when i was listening to your podcast you kept saying glowies and i okay. kind of knew what you were talking about what, what's a glowy i actually the funny thing is glowy is apparently i found out i guess i probably made like four or five months ago i found out that originally uh, I'm not gonna say it on your show because I don't I don't know what you how you feel about it, but you've heard Tower Gang. I don't care. Glow N word was the original version of it, which oh, essentially just okay. meant a fed. But the funny thing is, I I didn't even know that for the longest time. Uh, not that I really care if anything, it makes it funnier to me. But it, it, for some reason, that was like the term they used for feds, you know, like on Reddit forever ago, and then it kind of became more mainstream, and they got changed to glow glowy. Uh, yeah, and they dropped the N word because yeah. they're like that's a lot to say every time. <laughs> <laughs> can't use it in every situation <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. 
<laughs> but yeah, and, and I didn't even know. I'd probably been using it for years. Didn't even know about that connotation. If anything, it made me giggle when I found out about like what? That's what it came from. That's awesome. But anyways, <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's it's like it just means fed. But I I've always liked that term because it's like if you say someone's a glowy or I I like saying they're glowing because it's it's a way to say because. I, I, I will admit, I, I've always hated in this movement, uh, people are like, oh, that guy's a fed, this guy's a fed, or whatever, like, okay, I mean, yeah, it's one thing if you're doing for comedic purposes, or if someone has very clearly demonstrated, like, insane fed behavior, if you're like, I don't, I'm not saying he is a fed, but if he wasn't a fed, would, or uh, would he act any differently, like, kind of something like yeah. that, like, like, but with glowy, or glowing, I like it, because you're not necessarily saying they actually are a fed, you're saying he's glowing, like he's putting yeah. off the signs. He's he's radiating. Like you're like like how and you're like that's why you can be like he glows like the sun or you can be like there's a little bit of a glow on him. Like well, I don't know. Keep an eye on that one. Like it, it, I, I do like that connotation of it because it is like almost like you have a scale to it as opposed yeah, to yeah, it's fed like, or not it's, fed. <laughs> it's like I'm not gonna I'm not gonna give you a hard definition, but something's up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Like I don't, I don't know. You're, you're putting off a lot of weird vibes here, and you're you're glowing a little. Like, yeah, <laughs> but yeah, that's what glowy is. So, but a little inside baseball. But yet, it also comes from a naughty Reddit word originally. <laughs> <laughs> um, we got a little sidetracked on glowy. We we were talking Roger Moore, I think. Yeah, Roger Moore. There essentially was like a basically a fake robbery, which they used to get a ton of guns, ton of money from this guy they were able to use to build to essentially to fund their operations you know what they were trying to do and this guy glows like the sun as well yeah uh which once again refer to my series uh um, um I, I can't remember all the specifics but that dude was doing a ton of fed stuff a ton uh you know very clearly uh i, I mean technically i would say if i had to guess that if i had to guess what he was I, I would say he wasn't an actual Fed. I think he was some sort of like Fed asset or informant or something along those lines. But yeah, he was like, um, I think he was like a, I want to say he had like a boat business or something, but then it just so happened he was always selling to like the Cubans and the, the Feds. And then also he was like, it looked like he was like, may have been running stuff for them. And it, there, there's a whole long laundry list of stuff with him that is wild. But, and then also he just so happened to then become the star witness. Um, and you know it, it it yeah that that one is weird roger moore i need to go to a dive I, I was really fresh on strassmeyer because i actually like today re-listened to the episode uh because i've been trying to like every so often put out like a little thing to add to my master thread that i kind of have on my my twitter and strassmeyer was fresh in my head still so roger moore i'm like oh like i want to be very clear i am not the okc like the okc guy if you want the okc guy that's my dude richard booth he's the dude who's my expert my like subject matter expert for my series, the one I've had pretty much on with me the entire time. I did one bonus episode with Ken Silva, who's a great reporter uh, slash journalist or whatever you want to call him. Um, but uh, yeah, it, definitely Richard Booth. He's your guy. He's the one who boom, 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 just spout out all these facts. I'm just the guy who's picked up a lot of his stuff through osmosis over time. So I'm just the the podcaster that asked questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And he's got a lot of stuff. Uh, where is it at? Libertarian Institute, right? Yeah, he's a Libertarian Institute's OKC guy. He, uh, they have a whole archive there at the libertarianinstitute.com or .org or whatever the hell it is. Uh, I don't think it's .com. I want to say it's .org. I don't know. But anyways, it feels like, it feels like an org type website. Yeah, but he, uh, <laughs> yeah, he's, uh, they got up a whole giant archive of like pretty much just about anything you can think of, OKC wise there. So if you really want to do like the deep digging and the sources and stuff, that's the place to go. But yeah, that's how you know he's good shit. He's a uh, Scott Horton's dude, like uh, Richard Booth. He is like you're my OKC dude. So that, yeah. that's who Richard Booth is. Yeah. Okay. Um, want to ask you this? Uh, with a lot with a lot of the, I think uh, OKC gets this a lot where you like everyone will everyone will break down. They're like, this happened and this is weird and that's weird and this is weird and then like kind of people will go like. Yeah, but why? And because every conspiracy has that. But you're like, okay, it happened. But like, why? Like, why would? Why did? Why would they do that? And I think OKC kind of trips up a lot of people. Where you go, yeah, but why would the government do that? Like, what? What's the? I guess what would be the why on OKC? I mean, it immediately villainized the militia movement, which was huge at that time, like huge, huge. Because after their blunders, because that's a, the a key part. Like, you almost can't even really analyze it like you know like from the larger picture 
OKC without looking at Waco and Ruby Ridge that led up to him because you know you had Waco or you had Ruby Ridge which inflamed the militia movement they screwed that up then shortly after there was almost like the feds were like well we'll do something cool and we'll do Waco and this will work out really well and fix it and then they just made it even worse and then then comes like and all they did was keep making the militia movement stronger with those two and then they had OKC and now you have this militia guy who just blew up a federal building, which kind of almost seems plausible from an outside view of this, like this guy who's like a militia guy would be like, you know what? Fuck the feds. Let's blow up a federal building. And it's like, okay, but like, I don't know. Like if you've actually been like sort of associated with like most militia movements or looked into them or looked into like what three percenters believe or like Boogaloo boys or whoever, like the people who kind of fit that mold, most of them aren't about like offensive, like being in an offensive capacity. And even then, most of them are very like, they're very much like they don't fire unless fired upon type mentality. Like they're, that's usually how most of them are. And then on top of that, like, like, and if they were going to be like, usually it'd be like just feds. Like the big thing about the Murrah building is there were the, the, the biggest thing was the daycare center. There was a bunch of kids there. Uh, the ATF wasn't even there when it happened, which is another screwy thing about that. They all got a pager. Uh, I mean, I think there's only like one source that corroborates this to be fair that they got a pager. I believe it was at, in like in the aftermath of the thing, uh, a reporter showed up, was, uh, asked, was a kind of interviewing one of the people there. I guess there was some guy who was like in the rubble kind of looking for his wife and they just kind of like pulled him aside and talked to him. And he was saying that, uh, uh, that, that I don't remember who exactly he was, um, you know, Richard Booth, no soft off his head, but he was talking to, um, he was t like, he was talking to the reporter and the reporter's. Oh, fuck, I'm fucking this up. The guy who was talking to the reporter said that earlier he had talked to one of the ATF guys who was there in the aftermath type thing, and he had said that they had gotten a pager to not show up to work that day. And, like, and that was, so that's on recording, like, on video somewhere. I forget the specific, uh, well, I want to say it was like yeah. KTOR or something. That's what's coming to my mind right now. But, and yeah, it's literally, yeah. Sorry, I don't know if you know, like, he's, for, like, context, do you know, like, is that, like, an office of them? So, like, 30, 40, 50 guys? I don't know exactly how many, but enough to where that's weird. And yeah, also there were that's... bomb squad sightings, too, like, prior to. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, there's like a lot a whole, of weird shit. It sounds like a whole office worth of ATF agents just yeah. all didn't show up on that day. Yeah, there's definitely uh, prior knowledge is a big aspect of this case too. Of like, what did what did they know? Why wh why did, did they not show up? There were also, like I said, there was a bomb squad that showed up. Like I think a few like earlier in the morning before the bombing. Because I guess that was like a big aspect of it. I don't remember. I don't remember specifically who or what where this comes from. But there was something that they thought maybe it was going to be at a different time. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Like, uh, do, 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 yeah, it was K O F R. To be clear, I just looked at my notes real quick. Uh, yeah, there was a bomb squad sighting at 6 a.m. before the bombing, but there's definitely a lot more that like implies uh, prior knowledge as well. But like, I believe Richard Booth wrote a whole fucking paper on the prior knowledge aspect. There's definitely a lot of weird shit there. Uh, there's so many weird aspects of the story. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So generally, to demonize the militia movement I, that, yeah that, that would be my vibe there also was yeah. i think i think they tried to pass some stuff in the aftermath as well i don't remember what i'll go through and what no, but, I'm, yeah. yeah i think like a day later clinton tried to pass some like uh anti-gun thing <laughs> yeah i don't <laughs> so know like, if it got through i don't remember but you know but it's that, that one always stuck out to me because i was like you know it was a bomb in a truck right <laughs> not a gun um yeah man um yeah, it's just a lot, a lot, a lot of stuff there. Um, I want to wrap up in a sec, but I actually wanted to pivot on. I know you said, I know you said you more enjoy the theory and the conspiracies, but I do want to ask you one sort of current thing because I saw you tweeting a bunch about this. And I thought you had some good tweets and uh, um, how the national divorce conversation is getting its way to like conservatives and stuff like that. Oh and God, yeah, yeah, which like I don't know what. Cause I saw you, you were having some great tweets about what's your like general thought on, cause there's a lot of people. I saw James Lindsay talking about it. Matt Walsh was having a little bit of a breakdown cause they don't, the, they, they can't seem to conceive the whole national <laughs> divorce conversation. So just like, I don't know what you take on that. I think I'm all for it. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. I, it, it, it was more just irritating me. Like I only put out like two tweets on it and uh, like, 
because like I almost didn't want to get involved because then the type of people who were talking about it, I was like, these guys don't know the fuck they're talking about. <laughs> like you can just tell, like if you someone who's like read a decent amount, and I'm definitely by no means like a secession expert or you know, but I've I've read Hoppe, I've read other stuff, so like I've read enough and kind of like you know have a good idea, but it's like all their takes were like like Walsh was saying dumb shit like oh what like. Uh, how's this going to work? We're just going to like break it in half. You know, like, or I don't remember exactly, but like takes like that. We're just like, I don't know, be a little more creative. Like, I don't know. There's more than one <laughs> ways this can work. Like it was just the most like surface level dumb takes. I guess not even like dumb, just like surface level, but it like had this air of like trying to be intellectual. We were like, you're just barely scratching the surface and like, you're trying to put this out as this like, you know, intellectual idea. And it's just irritating to me, but, and then also the progressives screaming about, Oh, this will mean violence. And you're like, well, if, if okay. Like if, if, I mean, yes, it's definitely a possibility if there was secession, obviously this happened last time there was a civil war, but it's like, like my thought in that is like, okay. Okay. Like if you're saying that if you try to, you know, peacefully, you know, break off from some entity and they're like, we're going to fucking hurt you if you do that. If anything, that's more like, I don't know. Maybe I don't want to be in this relationship if this is how it's going to be, you know, like, you <laughs> yeah. Know? <laughs> and I think people get, I think people a lot of times in those, in that conversation, um, uh, with the national divorce. And if anyone's listening and they're not familiar, it's basically the concept of like, yo, none of us can get along. I think we need to all take our ball and go to our respective corner <laughs> and just, uh, peacefully interact and shit. But, um, I think a lot of people hyper focus on and libertarians get this shit a lot of time when talking to people who aren't familiar with the ideas that people hyper focus on like, well, how specifically will it happen? And it's like, well, can we acknowledge that this right now is really fucked yeah. and it just seems like no one's getting along like at all? Yeah, it's, it's funny, too, because a lot of these, especially the conservative ones, like they have this concept of like federalism and the idea that like you're supposed to have, you know, all the different states and then you have this overarching federal thing that like generally it's kind of like the idea is supposed to be every one of these states is supposed to be like a experiment doing their own thing to some extent. But we kind of have this federal thing that's kind of provides basic guidelines of like, you know, generally the way to look at it is like, oh, we have the Bill of Rights and that's kind of what they're supposed to be concerned with. Like they basically interject if one of these people are trying to fuck with the Bill of Rights and cause some problem there. But aside from that, go to town. And it's like, it's supposed to be this idea of this like unification of all these states that come together for this. And the idea that they're like, oh, but we can't break off. You're like, why couldn't they? Like you just said, they're supposed to be kind of separate entities. If one decides that they don't want to be part of this anymore, like why not? Let, let them be their own thing. Like if California wanted to secede, I'm all for it. If anything, I wish they would secede. <laughs> like, you know, like oh yeah, that's my that's my wet dream. Is like California secede, do all your goofy shit, and then we can see we can see how how well it works. <laughs> yeah, and the funny thing is, like, if you do get into the theory world aspect of it, like, like this is one point Hoppe brought up, like, if say Cali Cali did succeed, like, yes, it could go down in a blazing ball of fire, but it, that actually might fix a lot of its problems. Because now they're more, they are no longer able to blame their problems as much on other people. It, it changes the incentives to where yeah. now they're like a smaller entity. The incentives have changed. They're more likely to want to do a little better, if that makes sense. I'm not doing it, uh, doing it justice. I highly suggest people read Democracy, the God that Failed. He goes into, there's a whole, you know, I think a chapter or so where he goes into secession and how it changes the, uh, it changes the, incentives and how they operate and it would make them more likely to be essentially causes them to likely act better obviously it doesn't ensure that they will but it makes it more in their interest to do so they're no longer able to suck off federal money uh yeah. you know they're more of their own entity they, they they actually have to be productive they like it 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 it, it essentially and it also causes them to be more unified in a certain sense among their people all, all sorts of things yeah yeah you know when you don't have the federal government to lean on yeah there's just a big there's like a big incentive like oh if we don't do this we'll die <laughs> yeah like, exactly well, or they'll move will... to they'll move or they'll move to another state you know or, or i guess at that point another country you know yeah true very yeah. very true um all right man i think that was i think that was great i got uh i got all my okc questions answered um yeah, I guess uh, to wrap it up, just throw out uh, where you want people to go check your shit out. 
Uh, yeah, I have the No Way Jose show. If you do like the theory slash conspiracy type stuff, generally just kind of whatever the hell I want to cover, uh, which tends to be that. I don't know. I, I, I like to I like to say that in case I ever just want to cover something else. I don't know. That's why I named it No Way Jose and not like Liberty Talk or something. I don't know. Like <laughs> you know what I mean? Because then it's like now I'm caged into that. Um, but yeah, go check out my No Way Jose show. It's on YouTube. All the aud- audio podcasts. It's on Aussie as well. Uh, if you want to follow me on Twitter at Tower Gang Jose. If you want like more like if you like offensive comedy, go check out Tower Gang. Uh, yeah, we're uh, we're on YouTube, we're on Rumble, we're on Odyssey, also in all the audio packages. Weirdly enough, we I think our best numbers come from Spotify, which is weird to me. Uh, really? Yeah, but we also have video on Spotify, so I think. Oh that, yeah, no, which I don't usually... get. I I hate video on Spotify. I don't get why it does so well, but. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, yeah, we um no, I've been noticing on on like my other podcast, uh, Panties in the Mouth, like because for the longest time, like uh, iTunes would be like sixty percent, and you'd get like twenty, maybe twenty five percent Spotify. Now I've been noticing Spotify is creeping up to like forty, forty five percent of our shit. Do you Spotify's do video get, on yours too, or no? On, on yeah, Spotify. we do video on ours too. On Spotify, specifically? yeah, okay, yeah, because that's the thing. Like I, I never. I don't even know if I ever even checked to see if it allowed me to. I, think, I don't know if you want to get to a certain point, you can do it. Uh, I, I just didn't really care if I did it on Spotify. But I guess for some reason, that's a game changer for people. They like the video on the Spotify. I don't know. It's weird. Yeah, I th- well, I think uh, Rogan helped, and then they've gotten enough Spotify exclusive. I actually switched over to Spotify because I started listening to Rogan over there. And I was like, just the complete mark for what they were going for, where I was like, oh, this is pretty good. I'm going to stay here. Yeah, Spotify is all I use for podcasts, pretty much. Like, I I use YouTube and and uh, YouTube and Spotify. Like, depending on what it is, if it's like a video thing, if it's an audio thing, it's pretty much all Spotify for me. That's a uh, that's a. Uh, but it really, for me, it's just because like that's what I used first, and I'm a tech idiot, so I'm just like, and I don't like to change, and I'm like, oh, this works for me. <laughs> it's the same way I have. It's the same reason I have all Apple stuff, where I'm just like, all my things are here. I don't yeah. want to go to somewhere else because all my things are here. <laughs> yeah, I already have this set up nice and cozy. I know how to use it. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But yeah, it's, right, uh, it's me. Hell yeah, dude. This was great. Thank you so much for coming on. Everyone check out Jose's shit. I will have links for it down below. So if you forgot any of that, it will be there. All right. Thank you. Be about it. Peace.